Okay, welcome everyone uh, to our program, National Treasures, Unlocking the Secrets of Government Libraries. Uh, we have four amazing people joining us this, us this evening. Uh, before we get started, I did wanna let you know we're doing things a little bit differently tonight. Uh, due to security ish, uh, issues, one of our speakers, um, we uh, cannot record her this evening. So we'll have our first three speakers. After that, we'll have a question and answer session with those three speakers. Then we'll stop our recording at that point and we'll have our fourth speaker. So after we do our first question and answer period, make sure you stick around because we're still going to have a fourth speaker after that. Okay. Also, before we get started, I want to let you know that we're going to be live tweeting tonight. Misha is going to be live tweeting. Um, she's going to use the hashtag government libraries. So keep an eye out for that on Twitter. Um, also, as we go through tonight, if you have any uh, questions that you have for any of our speakers, uh, make sure to go ahead and put it into our chat. My uh, partner in crime uh, for programming here, Sarah, is going to be keeping track of all the questions you put in, in there, and then we'll ask them all at the end. Okay, and without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And our first speaker tonight is Andrew Blatchford, who is an archivist and project manager for the Northwind Group. Andrew, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. I am Andrew Blatchford, as uh, I've been introduced. I'm going to start, try to share my uh, PowerPoint slides right now. You cannot start screen share while others are participating. Sorry, um, I'll try it again. Let's say. Share. So, so I'll start at the beginning. So yes, um, I was recruited by Sarah uh, to give a talk about kind of the untraditional side of government information centers, government libraries, government archives, uh, because I'm kind of a consultant. I do work primarily um, at a military installation called Yuma Proving Ground in Yuma, Arizona. Um, about 75% of my uh, time is spent there, but I, I do consult all across the nation, um, even where Sarah lives in Kansas City, Missouri with Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, so my perspective, national treasures, archiving, managing, crunching data, destroying documents uh, of government information. As kind of a consultant, um, adjunct, and kind of a mercenary. Um, Again, I'm Andrew Blatchford. Uh, my master's degree I did at the University of South Carolina. I um, also have a certification with the Academy of Certified Archivists through the uh, American um, Archival Association, SAA. Um, my background with SLA, which you all are part of, I believe, um, is I used to be the uh, chair of my student chapter back in 2010 when I was a student. I'm also um, an active member of the uh, San Diego chapter of the uh, Special Libraries Association. And I don't do much with the uh, division I'm part of, the environmental uh, division uh, that kind of merged with farming, but I'm kind of detached from that. Um, but yeah, if you want to, um, after I'm done talking kind of about um, my career path and what I do, um, you're welcome to email me with any questions. My email's here. Um, also. Um, Sarah can forward any uh, questions you have. And I also have a LinkedIn page like most professionals, so that's there too. And this is a random stealth cam picture of myself. It's not the most flattering, and I had LASIK, so I don't have glasses anymore. But um, yeah, uh, part of my job actually is managing a bunch of uh, wildlife camera type stealth cams all throughout a military installation about the size of Rhode Island. So that's uh, fun. I get to like, you know, make sure the algorithms that detect um, people and different animals or whatever are working by kind of doing a check. Uh, so that it was just a random image on my computer that sort of represented myself. So I decided that that would be the picture I chose for that slide. So anyway, um, I kind of followed the plan uh, structure uh, for the uh, talk about um, how we should structure it. So I just kind of went into it. So. Um, I kind of have, I again, work mostly in a non-library, non-traditional library kind of work environment. In Yuma, Arizona, the client installation, they provide me a kind of normal office environment where I can uh, have a computer and, you know, different computers actually. I have a government computer, I have a corporate computer. They're connected to different networks. Um, and, you know, different, you know, support and stuff. I have two interns actually, one's an um, 
anthropologist, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, and also there's different uh, arc small rooms that are kind of designated as records rooms and archival rooms. Um, I also, for other projects I do outside of the Yuma Proving Ground project, uh, I have a location uh, at a Main Street uh, downtown Yuma, Arizona office, which is pretty nice. Um, and I can basically do work without the conflict of interest uh, doing other projects. Uh, some of the other projects I do are uh, working with historical records uh, for different military installations. Digitization is a huge part. Um, Sometimes it's really just a bunch of data that I'm basically or, you know, asked to organize from ser get servers, like gigabytes of random things. I'm basically just tasked to kind of organize it and make it usable to researchers. Um, with the Yuma, Arizona client location, my job has varied throughout the years. I interact with a bunch of records that are produced, but I also have really kind of interesting positions, which I'll get to the next slide. Um, kind of jumping ahead uh, there's also an off-site cultural resource curatorial uh, repository we have it with a local tribe that's in the yuma arizona area for depositing uh cultural artifacts we have a in-situ uh, policy which means that most historical and cultural artifacts if they're found and if they're not going to be disturbed by some kind of munitions test because you mean proving ground yuma proving ground is uh, basically, like 90% of the work that's done there is to test out different rockets, different ammunitions. They blow things up. So we definitely need to move uh, things that are sensitive and of cultural and historical and tribal and cultural interest away from sites that might be disturbed, as we call it. And travel. I, I do go um, across the country. I usually basically travel probably about five or six times for work a year. Um, two of those times generally like more than a week. Uh, my largest project is in, Kansas, is in the Kansas City, Missouri area, um, but I also work uh, in the San Francisco Bay area and also uh, Texas occasionally. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends. So <clears throat> that's kind of like some of the uh, tasting of the kind of non-library non work environments that I work in. Okay, so this is the three tiers of traditionalness of what I do. Um, very traditional things that you know, can be expected from a master of library information science when they um, go into a job. It's like, yeah, records management, organization of different types of uh, records. Some of them are very like, expected. Some of them are very much just like data sets. So it's like data archiving. Um, uh, archiving historical and cultural resources, mostly again at that cultural uh, curatorial facility, but also we do have a, some housing with a local museum. Uh, reference services, so I mean, I basically manage the servers uh, for the environmental science division, so I basically uh, act as the kind of the focal point for uh, people who have questions or need documents from. And, Records digitization, uh, when I first came into Human Proving Ground, a lot of it was analog records and through the years we've managed to make it for the very majority part 100 percent digitized so it's basically just at our fingertips like you know um in the server basically and also legacy and developed uh record systems so but there's some less traditional aspects like project management i have to manage especially the smaller projects uh the projects with myself including budgeting and stuff like that uh G uh, graphic information systems is a huge information uh, source and it's ev everyone uses at Yuma Proving Ground to um, even like things that you wouldn't expect to like, you know, make notes in like on what's happening. Uh, it's all basically through GIS and like sharing a GIS like shape files and things like that. Like here's what we did today. Like they just give you a shape file. So having to learn that language and learn how to capture that for posterity and organize it. It's untraditional, but it still uses kind of library science skills. Uh, a lot of data archiving, as I mentioned, database administration. Um, yeah, so basically having to uh, kind of manage permissions and, you know, uh, organize the whole like um, databases, but also also servers and things like that. Uh, agency coordination. So what I do also is I, I work 
I don't like have a one language that I have for like how I catalog things because I have to work with the Federal Record Center or uh, NARA, which has a like way of they want to catalog things or things submitted, but also with other agencies which use completely different systems. And it's basically trying to coordinate information between them and sort of trying to learn multiple languages, but not being master of all, but basically being able to communicate or access a particular database that a particular agency uses to be able to retrieve information from that. So it's a lot of balancing um, of the kind of skills that we should have. Um, and project bidding, you know, I basically do project proposals and things like that. Uh, competitive intelligence, they cheats in some uh, master of library information science uh, programs is really, was really helpful. I only took one class, but I've been leaning on it really heavily for a lot of that kind of work. Um, not at all traditional work. Sometimes I basically called out to the field to do help with archaeological teams, mostly uh, because I know how to program like uh, iPads and things like that. So I basically help uh, in the field, like do data collection. And since it's easier to kind of do things on the fly rather than doing things remotely from the office, plus they need some people to walk transects and I'm into physical fitness. I volunteer for that all the time. So I get to go out and do archaeology, which is pretty awesome. Um, Environmental sampling and lab coordination, I have to um, sometimes do uh, environmental sampling, like water sampling and stuff occasionally. And um, because it was kind of futuristic, I, I basically took the lead on being kind of, when they had like a big lead-based paint um, call or whatever for one of my clients, I basically super volunteered and basically taught myself how to do um, x-ray um, analysis of paint samples and things like that because that, was, that sounded pretty cool. So. Um, yeah, so I guess the path to this kind of non-library information role, um, I basically uh, wanted to uh, do something maybe like academics since I was a history undergrad. But in graduate school, I was kind of seduced to the special library side because a lot of the classes were more interesting. You got a lot more kind of, like, it seemed like, especially my advisor was pushing that like you get a lot more autonomy. It's a lot more uh, easy to find interesting work. It's less competitive. It, you kind of get to, you know, create your own kind of job description, it, like, which panned out to be pretty much true, which is great. Um, when I graduated with that kind of like, okay, yeah, I definitely like archives. I definitely like special libraries. So I was trying to like hash it out and try to find a, my first gig. Um, the Port of Portland was like a good, like I wanted to move back to Portland, Oregon, it didn't happen, uh, which, is, which is okay, I, I visit there all the time. Um, but I did like interview for the Port of Portland, which had oh, a really interesting It was this one. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I think somebody, somebody's mic must have gotten turned on. Oh, You're okay, I didn't know if anyone had a question or anything, I, I just heard like a bleep sound, so okay. <laughs> I'll continue. Um, so yeah, then I moved to Yuma because I kind of had the idea that like, okay, yeah, the Port of Portland, the, the work they were doing was really fascinating. I kind of wanted to see what that was like. So I, I joined the environmental consultancy, not the current, uh, North, not, not the Northwind group, but one, another one that um, eventually got uh, beat out for the uh, YPG job by Northwind. Um, and with that, because I did perform a lot of like unconventional stuff uh, for the environmental consultancy, and I also had that strong background, I got kind of like the best of both worlds. I got to basically uh, be kind of the subject matter expert and be a kind of a project manager for small projects with Northwind, um, but also kind of continue uh, building my uh, strength at Yuma Proving Ground and sort of like, you know, growing there too. So, and then I can bring back the kind of different experiences within my field from the other projects back to Yuma Proving Ground. And so it's kind of a bit good synergistic role, but it sort of was not the traditional path. Um, so they asked me to give you some, uh, give recommendations for current students. Um, I guess my recommendations were, um, if you are attracted to the kind of untraditional um, work environments, and you don't necessarily have your heart set on being a particular, um, working for a particular agency. Um, a lot of job opportunities do exist. Um, you know, a lot of agencies need this kind of skill set. Um, and they might be different. Um, you know, I work with government information, even though I'm not set in a government institution that you, it has a brand name, but uh, I still work with you know, informa uh, government information. I still manage to unlock government secrets uh, as uh, I think the uh, pro uh, program description used the word. Uh, 
but it doesn't necessarily need to be conventional. And if you work for the right company, um, your role can evolve. You can sort of be a bonsai tree and you sort of can like grow yourself to what you want to be. And of course, technology will change the nature of information work. It's changed even in the last seven years I've been a professional, um, you know, again, from analog records to digitizing to basically everyone working uh, with digital records to everyone wanting to be on the cloud and basically have digital records on their fingertips, even on their phones. All of it has been like within my lifetime as a professional. <laughs> so that will change, I'm sure, even into the future. I'm sure a lot of my work at YPG will be drone related. I'll, I'll fly a drone versus having to go out and do um, wildlife camera checks and things like that. Um, and also culture, you know, I have a intern, um, which I mentioned a anthropology uh, who is very much a millennial, very much like wants to have their work be, have meaning like in a stereotypical way. And that's great. But also I have older, you know, coworkers and customers who are very traditional. You basically, um, and everything will change too. Like, you know, they, you know, the new generation will become the older generation, a new generation will emerge from that. So everything is in flux. So as long as you have an open mind, I think uh, the world is yours. And that's it. So that was my uh, presentation. And I will stop sharing. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a lot of information you just gave us. I know I'm going to have to probably go back and rewatch the recording just to get everything. Thank you so much. Yeah. And sorry if I went a little over time, too. That's okay. It, it happens. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Jill Koneko. Uh, who is the director of the library division at Zimmerman Associates Incorporated. Jill, if you want to go ahead and start. Sure. Um, this panel fits very nicely with a session that we just did with the Maryland chapter of SLA. There are just so many ways that librarians can fly our, our craft and our trade these days. It's really unlimited as to what we can do. Um, I am the Division Director for Library Services at Zimmerman Associates, Inc. It's a company based out of Fairfax, Virginia that has over the past 40 plus years provided library staffing and services to federal libraries. Um, so I'll also follow the, um, the outline that Jessica and Sarah provided um, to give you a, a little bit of background on who I am. Um, I was inspired to be a librarian um, when I was eight years old. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Boardman was my elementary librarian, and uh, she always had the right, the right information, but also the, the right book for the right person at the right time. And um, it was from about that time that my sister and I decided that um, we wanted to play library. That was our favorite, favorite game. Uh, we had fake due cards, and we had stamps, and we put um, check out uh, materials in, in all of our uh, books in our library. Um, and we used to exchange books with one another, each of us playing you know, the customer or the librarian, um, as well as with our friends. And I think it's interesting to note, not only am I a librarian, but my sister is also a librarian. And my sister is also a librarian in a non-traditional context. I graduated in 1994 with my Master of Library Science from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, at that time, I did field studies at both the libraries at Pitt's Business School and also at Westinghouse. Um, when I was in library school, I was so fortunate to have had so many wonderful adjunct professors, um, many of whom were very active in the Pittsburgh chapter of SLA. And so it was um, under their tutelage, under their coaching, that I then became an active member as a student in the student chapter of the University of Pittsburgh um, with the special library uh, chapter there. So how did I get from there to here? Um, I started as a library page in my, in my high school, in my uh, public library, and uh, worked as a library page throughout college. Um, and then even when I was in, in grad school, even though I, I had um, responsibilities with my, my classes and my assignments and my field studies, uh, my activity in the Special Libraries Association chapter at Pitt, um, I continued to work in my public library. My initial aspiration was to be a, a children's librarian. Um, but it was upon 
graduation from uh, Pitt that I uh, moved back to, or I moved down to DC and worked uh, for a succession of different organizations. You'll see them listed here. And most of them are um, either government funded projects or they were government agencies themselves. Um, Camp Dresser uh, and McKee was a Cambridge and Massachusetts based engineering firm that was started by Peace Corps volunteers who returned from um, their work in Latin America and wanted to continue that work on the private side. Um, all of the work was USAID funded. That's the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is an agency within the U.S. Department of State. And a lot of my work was doing light research or document delivery for Peace Corps volunteers who were working with uh, Camp Dress Army Key engineers in places as far flung as Guatemala, Nicaragua, um, Chile, and other countries in Latin America. I think of all of the jobs that I had, uh, my job at Fannie Mae was probably the most challenging, but probably not because of what you might think uh, in terms of the work. Um, Fannie Mae or the Federal National Mortgage Association um, needed to have the executives up to date on um, global activities, global news, and specifically industry news, not just business and finance, but uh, within the, the mortgage industry. So my early birds clips had a 5.30 a.m. starting time, which means I needed to have my butt in my seat in the library at 5.30 a.m. Um, this is back in the, the uh, mid-90s, and um, there weren't a lot of online resources at that time, but I would do Dow Jones, which is now Factiva, um, Bloomberg, LexisNexis, and then I would supplement that with photocopying different articles that would be of interest to the executives, make a big bad photocopy of all of those with copyright permissions from the publishers um, or the aggregators, and then distribute that to all of the executives so that it was on their seats when they come into the office at seven o'clock. I needed to have um, Jim Johnson, the CEO's, uh, to his desk by 10 of 7, which made it uh, a little bit of a tough um, task trying to make sure that I, I got all of the clips I needed and got them photocopied and to his desk starting. Um, kind of skipping around a bit, I went to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the, the mid-90s, um, late 90s, at a time when a lot of libraries were closing. I got the amazing opportunity to order to uh, set up a new library um, not only start up a new library but start up a new library in Charleston South Carolina just a couple miles from the beach that included um, working with the floor plan deciding what furniture to put in how to lay that out work with the architects to arrange it so that the, the books for example weren't um, exposed to the sunlight from our floor to ceiling um, lights um, or impacted um, by the, the weather um, that Charleston is, is prone to. I was the library director at U.S. News and Report, um, where I managed change not only in the library, but also in the newsroom. Um, we were a very traditional library when I, I first started, but we ended up being a, a library that was making a profit because we managed all of our content, not just inbound licensing, but also outbound. So it was the library that sought the licenses with different aggregators, including EBSCO and ProQuest and LexisNexis, and managed those feeds, but also generated content for not just their print publication, um, but also for usnews.com. Um, one of the things we did was a top 10 things you might know or need to know about Situation X or Bill X or um, a candidate for uh, office. Most recently, um, my traditional library path has taken me to Nasagadu Library, which was named FedLink's 2016 Large Library of the Year. What's really interesting about this library is that it was on the brink of closure in 20, 2012. Um, they had actually shuttered the library for a period of about four months. Um, no one was allowed to enter the library. The physical collection was um, not accessible to customers. It was deemed to be um, more 
economically um, sound to provide a digital library in lieu of a physical library. So while the library staff uh, was reduced, they were um, uh, still, you know, kind of a skeleton crew providing virtual service. Um, and it was through the efforts of our fantastic researcher community and the scientific union at Goddard um, that went to our center leadership and basically said, hey, if you want us to continue doing our work, then we're gonna to have to have the library again. In 2014 to 2016, the library went through a very extensive renovation. Um, not only did it uh, create more modern um, interiors, but we um, added a collaborative area, which includes modular furniture that allows groups in as small as two or as big as 60. Um, to maneuver different areas and different um, partitions and tech pods around the library to accommodate their group sizes and also their group needs. So at any time in the library, we may have four or five different groups camped out um, doing very different activities from um, just team meetings to SWOT analyses um, to workshops. Now that's a look at my traditional job. Um, those are all very library-like. Um, mostly management, but a lot of research and, and reference, licensing content, using those databases to meet my, my uh, customers' needs, whether as a reporter at USN as a report or a scientist at uh, NOAA. But in the 25 years that I've, I've been a librarian, I've also uh, spent a lot of time working as a non-traditional library. And I've listed some of the companies with whom I've worked down at the bottom. Um, I started at LexisNexis. Um, I had a LexisNexis rep that hosted or sponsored an event of the South Carolina chapter that was hosted at my library at uh, NOAA. And she asked if she could come um, back later to do kind of a, a demo of the LexisNexis services for my library. She came on the very day that I learned that my contract, my company's contract with NOAA was not going to be renewed. Um, to say the least, it was a disheartening day. But it was also a very enlightening opportunity because um, that uh, customer meeting uh, with my, my vendor turned into a, an amazing job opportunity with LexisNexis. Um, Robin also became um, my best friend uh, and my godmother, or my son's uh, godmother. So, you know, from that dark and um, kind of scary day, just wonderful things happen for me personally and professionally. Um, since working at LexisNexis, I uh, worked at Dialog, which uh, is, uh, was, I guess, started in your neck of the woods in Mountain View. That was acquired by ProQuest in 2008. And uh, during my tenure at um, Dialog and then ProQuest, I managed the company's largest, single largest account which is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and that was the largest for just, not just Dialog, but also for, for ProQuest. I moved then to Elsevier, where I was um, tasked with marketing to government libraries and also Canada, um, which my um, manager would frequently remind me is a really big country, which I, I know from my Air Canada miles. I traveled extensively from one side of the country to the next, um, providing training and support for Science Direct, Scopus, and, and SciVal. I started next with a, a startup, uh, Redlink, which is also based in your neck of the woods. Um, Redlink it was a, a new company um, started by Adapon, which is a content platform provider. Um, I was the market director for information professionals for a new tool that was uh, designed to um, help librarians assess the usage on their e-resources at an aggregate level rather than one vendor at a time and without the need to aggregate it themselves. Um, from there, I moved to Zimmerman and I've been with Zimmerman now for two years. I manage a staff of 50 plus over four different contracts, including NIH Library, ERIC, which is a project of the U.S. Department of Ed, NLM, and NASA Goddard. Um, here's just kind of quickly a library overview of, um, if you will, my, my daily activities with my, um, with my various staff, staff excuse me. Um, we have a staff of 11, or excuse me, 12 uh, at NASA Goddard, and we do soup to nuts. We are the library. We 
buy the books, catalog the books, manage the books, circulate the books. Um, we um, license all of the databases, make them searchable, findable through discovery tools, through the library website and the library catalog. Um, we maintain all of that. We also provide reference and research, including customized research projects. We stand up um, all of these technologies um, and we also manage and maintain them with the um, government standards for security, which um, all of my panelists with government libraries can attest seem to change daily. Um, we also do a lot of uh, marketing and outreach. In fact, tomorrow I will be leading a discussion on predatory journals for my researchers. At the NIH, our staff, a little different. We have a staff of 15, a little more traditional. Uh, we have a bibliometric librarian and we have a fleet of interlibrary loan or document delivery librarians and techs. We have a cataloger. Uh, we have a couple tech guys. We have a sysadmin, a Drupal developer. Uh, tomorrow, I'm interviewing a biostatistician who will be uh, joining our team. Um, and then I also have a project manager for custom database project manager um, who oversees the work on Allsped. Um, she is also a card carrying librarian um, and her role is in uh, content uh, curation, content um, organization and lifting up with some UX responsibilities to a publicly accessible database called Allsped. At NLM, our guys are mostly focused on uh, library techs and, and clerks with a few librarians, mostly cataloger types, on um, the collection of the NLM, uh, working in the reading room, um, meeting customers' needs for books that are pulled from the NLM's extensive collection and then returning the materials after use to their, their rightly positions in the stacks. We also do a lot of reformatting and the chat earlier, a lot of you were very interested in digitization. Under the NLM's uh, stewardship, one of the things they're doing is collecting, uh, curating, making accessible, reformatting through digitization um, pertinent works uh, with, uh, with medicine. And um, my team is focused very largely on that, trying to bring to bear all of those otherwise accessible only in print materials uh, for the digital world. And lastly, but not leastly, is ERIC, the Education Resources Information Center, which is a database of the Department of Education. So for example, if you're looking for information on information literacy, you go to eric.ed.gov and you'd find A and I entries for records for proceedings and for journal articles, all peer reviewed um, on the area of information literacy. On that team, uh, we have a, a number of indexers as well as content curators, people who deal with licensing with um, companies like Elsevier, for example, and then uh, some tech people. They get look pretty and searchable. So if you look at a day in my life, and my day to day is very different. Um, and my, uh, you know, I can go into work expecting I'm going to do tests A, B, and C, and I get there and my whole day blows up and I have a, a whole new list of tasks for the day. Um, but this is a, a list of some of the things that, that I do. I do a lot of reference um, when I can, when I'm at NASA Goddard, but to be honest, I, I do a lot of management, project management, program management, budget management, um, content management, but most importantly, people management. So, some of my tips for aspiring and for pros are um, what you've already done. Join a professional organization. I call SLA my support group, my 12-step group. Um, I have made lifelong friends through SLA. Um, and that was, as I mentioned earlier, my entree to library professional organizations when I was uh, but a baby librarian in library school. But while I was in SLA, I was a very active SLA member. Um, from the get-go. When I was in library school, I was volunteered to be the library management quarterly newsletter manager. That was a publication of the now named leadership and management division. Back in the day, it was the library management division. Um, my, my current role, um, very exciting. I am the president, uh, president elect 
for the Maryland chapter, but unfortunately, I need to um, relinquish that role in lieu of um, the division cabinet chair elect. I, I won my um, election for that position on the SBA executive board uh, in uh, September, and that is a three year gig. So I'll be chair elect in 2019, chair in 2020, and then past chair in 2021. Um, but you saw my various and sundry roles. I've hopscotched around a lot in this industry, both as a, a traditional and a non-traditional role, but SLA has always been my home. And, and to that end, I'd recommend you volunteer or micro-volunteer. And you know, volunteering doesn't need a lot of time. It doesn't need a lot of effort, but our library associations are volunteer driven, which means they're only as good as our volunteers. And we really need you. And we really need you guys as students. And we need you as early career. Um, in the Maryland chapter, um, we've seen a lot of change in our chapter in just the past couple of years. Um, our board uh, from two years ago um, is very different from our, our board today. And, and that's good because that means we're getting new volunteers, but it, it's also in a way sad for our chapter because a, a lot of that attrition happened as a result of retirements. Um, a lot of my um, fellow members in the Maryland chapter, and this isn't unique to the Maryland chapter, um, we're getting older and, and we're retiring and we need you guys to carry on and to continue building and promoting libraries within our respective organizations and beyond that. I suggest you engage and then stay connected. And there's so many different ways to do so, through blogs, through info pro journals. Um, I get information today, for example, and that keeps me um, connected with what's going on in the publishing world, in the tech world, kind of a, at a macro um, level. But I also participate in a lot of email discussion lists. I get a lot of emails. I probably get 500 emails a day, but that helps me to make sure that I'm staying connected, not only on that macro, but on the micro. I strongly encourage that you, you publish and you present. It's essential for you, your peers, and for our profession that you share your knowledge and your experiences. After all, right, you are the expert in what you know. Um, last week I was in Monterey for the Internet, Internet Librarian Conference, and when I sent in a proposal uh, almost a year ago, for the conference, I was just embarking on a bibliometrics program at NASA Goddard. How could I have gone wrong, right? Bibliometrics, everyone's doing it. Well, guess what? It didn't really go so well at, at NASA Goddard. And I hemmed and hawed, should I continue with the presentation, even though my, my experiment, if you will, didn't really go as well. But what I decided is it's important to share my failure with others because I learned so much from what didn't happen as well as what did happen with my endeavor with Dudley Magic of Goddard. And then I felt others would benefit from that too. And you know what? I heard from a lot of panel, a lot of attendees um, from my session that they found it very enlightening and very honest um, that someone came and said, hey, I tried, I gave it my best, I gave it my all, but it didn't fly. Speaking of flying, I encourage you to flock together with birds of a feather. So there are about seven of us um, from the Maryland chapter who are interested in data. We really like mucking around with data, data visualization, data analysis. And so um, over the course of uh, 10 weeks, over um, the beginning of the, the uh, 2018 calendar, we met in my office every Saturday for informal meetup to learn sessions. Um, we actually participated in an, a data viz um, MOOC that was sponsored by the Indiana University. Um, and it was kind of our opportunity to get together for some coffee clutch and also to like geek out. Um, but it was a really rewarding experience for each of us and as a group of friends and colleagues um, to learn together. Um, I recommend never stop learning. You know, participate in certificate programs, attend webinars, whether they're from the chapter, from SLA, other organizations, publishers. These are all great and largely free opportunities for you to expand your horizons and increase your knowledge. 
And then lastly, I'd recommend be flexible. So when I was in library school, I mentioned, I just wanted to be a children's librarian. I loved children's books. I loved children. I even liked their parents. But if I had stopped there, gosh, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Um, and it all, you know, goes with taking that, that leap of faith and trying something different, trying something new and walking without a net. Um, so I think those are all tips that I would recommend uh, for you. Um, my contact information is here. I am more than happy to provide um, offline consultation or, or conversations. In my capacity as the division director for library services, I am frequently looking for people. I, um, as I mentioned, have over 50 people on my team um, within the past Two months I've added three additional net new positions and I've had to backfill uh, two positions and that's pretty common so if you're interested in contracting not all government library jobs are filled with civil servants contracting is a different kind of experience but it's also a different way to provide public service and um, do some good and, and have fun while you're doing it so let me know if you have any questions Thanks so much for your time. I, I really am grateful that um, you included me in the panel and I look forward to learning with you from the other panelists. All right, thank you so much, Jill. Um, I know I actually am a member of the Maryland chapter of SLA. I unfortunately have never gotten involved with it because a lot of stuff goes on down in Baltimore and I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, but that tends to be a little closer to me than Philly, so I might have to reach out to you myself afterward. Um, next up, we have uh, Kathy, who is the Research and Instruction Librarian at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, you can put your, um, any questions you have that we'll answer during the question and answer session. Uh, just go ahead and put those into the chat box, okay? Thank you. Okay, am I, visible and can everyone hear me? Yep, you're good to go, Kathy. I can see your, your screen and can hear you. Excellent, okay. Um, my name is Kathy Norton and I am one of the research and instruction librarians here at the Naval Postgraduate School out here in Monterey, California. And I'm happy to share with you today some insights into my life here at NPS. A tiny, tiny bit of history about NPS is it was established in 1909 back on the East Coast, Maryland, Annapolis, with just 10 students and two Navy instructors. And then in 51, after the institution had grown substantially, it moved lock, stock, and barrel into a resort called the Hotel Del Monte here in Monterey, California. Who do we serve here at NPS? Well, officers from all of America's military service branches, as well as students from countries internationally, and then also for a civilian population, um, Homeland Security officials, fire chiefs, police chiefs, and the like. Uh, you may have heard of the Center for Homeland Security and Defense. Uh, we offer a graduate program in that, in that center. Our current enrollment is around 2,700. Almost a full third is distance learners, which can be a, a challenge when you're an officer out, out at sea or in a remote location in Afghanistan. What do we teach here? What's our uh, research and teaching areas? Well, there are four basic schools here. Um, the engineering and applied sciences. So it's, we, we don't really teach the pure sciences per se. It's all about its application for national security needs. So in engineering and applied sciences, we have applied math, electrical and computer engineering, mechanical and aerospace, 
meteorology, oceanography, physics, systems engineering, and a couple of academic groups, um, space systems and undersea warfare. I kind of had space on my mind before our meeting tonight because I was just at the space systems academics group uh, faculty meeting. And I'm responsible for most of those science departments except for um, two or three. It can be overwhelming, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, we also have a School of Business and Public Policy, which concentrates in acquisitions, program management, contracting, financial management, logistics, manpower, systems analysis, and information technology management. It's actually our largest, um, has our largest enrollment is that school. Then we have the International Graduate Studies School, uh, which is focuses on international security studies. So they try to address current and emergency, emerging, emerging security challenges and um, try to strengthen cooperation between US and other of our allied nations. And then the fourth school is the operational, oops, Sorry. Operational and Information Sciences. Um, school, which is uh, actually, it was interesting that you mentioned data science because they are one of the strategic goals coming up for the school is to explore data science and analytics. And so they are standing up a new interdisciplinary group called data science and analytics. And there are a plethora of other centers and institutes that I can't even name them all. There are so many, but for example, one of them is the Center for Civil and Military Relations. Okay, so NPS is one of those unique institutions that is both a military and an academic institution at the same time. We provide graduate level education for masters and PhD candidates. Um, a bit about the culture here. The tone is serious. As librarians, we have an important job to contribute to the mission of NPS in helping to develop the intellect, uh, the knowledge and skills of current and future military and civilian leaders. Um, the students here are very driven. <laughs> um, they've been sent by their commands to learn and produce at the graduate level. And then they're expected to then apply their acquired skills to improve the systems, the processes, the technology, and the capabilities of their respective branches and agencies. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is um, because we're a government institution, but also we're part of the DOD, uh, there are rules and regulations that some find cumbersome. There is definitely a level of bureaucracy that you probably should know about. Um, also, as a librarian, I do handle restricted content. So, there's, uh, I always have to be conscious about security pr procedures. And then we are a federal entity, so a stable budget is never a given. It depends on Congress. Uh, we, in my time here, which has been about eight years, um, there were two periods where we didn't have a budget and we were on furlough. So, you would think federal job pretty stable. It's not necessarily the case. Um, and then, fun little tidbit, I've gotten used to be called, being called ma'am, and I'm also um, used to all the acronym speak that is in the military. I mean, that's kind of overwhelming as well. To help you learn a little bit about our users, I'll share with you a couple of 
what we call personas. They are fictional characters that represent our primary user groups. And we found that understanding them, their needs and behaviors and goals, helps us design products, provide service, workshops, instruction to better meet their needs. So this is Nate, the Naval officer. He's a residential student. He's typically, um, most are male, 30 plus years old, an officer, married, father of young children, been in the military for almost 10 years. And he's coming to MPS after having been in theater or some other assignment, which means their bachelor's degree has been, uh, is about 10 plus years old. Another persona uh, we call Oscar the overachiever. He's typically a distance learner or hybrid distance residence. He's a little older, 40 plus years, married, father of teenagers, um, sometimes a military reservist or an actual naval officer. His bachelor's degree was received over 20 plus years ago. He's also a full time working professional and trying to earn his master's degree remotely. Uh, both resident and both Nate and Oscar are incredibly smart, smart action oriented achievers, but they've been out of the academic environment for many years. I mean, I've asked at workshops, uh, how long has it been since you've been in school? And it's 10, 15, sometimes for these DL students, 20, 25 years. And so um, the academic environment and the academic library can feel very foreign to them. And we need to empathize with their situation and keep in mind that with each reference interview, with each workshop we give, with every interaction, um, just to be sensitive to that as they acclimatize to back to graduate school and, and academia. Learning research and critical thinking writing, all those things come with practice, but they only have 18 months to progress through their studies and produce a culminating thesis. And then I won't even mention, um, I don't have time to mention, but we're working on two other personas, one for our international students and one for our faculty members. Okay, so as I said, I'm just traditional research and instruction librarian. Um, in the past, I was also the web services librarian. So I spend most of my time, this is what I look at, my computer screens. Uh, I do get out of my cave regularly though. Uh, we no longer have a physical service point on the floor anymore, but we get paged when there is a reference question. So my typical job duties include Library research assistance, which is staffing and responding to our virtual and in-person reference calls. Um, questions ranging from locate a specific article using the database or help students get started with their library research on the topic. Instruction, we offer in-person um, workshops. And within the last five years, the campus has established a graduate writing center and they produce and deliver most of the writing workshops offered. And the library, we focus on a workshop on library research and citation management software tools. And then uh, another part of my big part of my job is outreach and support to our assigned subject areas. I mentioned that I am responsible for many of the um, science areas. So it's for me, it's a matter of trying to regularly reach out to the new students and faculty every quarter to establish the library and its resources as a vital presence. Uh, it's in this world of Google Scholar, it's easy to overlook the value of library resources, but um, we try to send that message at every opportunity. That's not to say we don't encourage the use of Google Scholar, of course we do, but we try to tie it in also with using the library resources directly. And then other work as assigned, for example, I'm responsible for administering our LibGuide system, 
our research gui online guides. And um, in the past, I've led the use web working group team in um, uh, redesigning the website and then also started work on how we can improve our ex libris discovery system called primo into being a little bit more user friendly and i just put this up because <laughs> i don't always look at my computer screen i look at this which i would love to tell you is the my view from my window but actually i do not have a window and that is just a poster but looking at that helps me immensely uh, my career pathway I've been connected with libraries for much of my working life, 20 years in a public library as a library tech, doing cataloging and physical processing and public services, working up at, at the CERC desk. And then I went, decided to go to library school at the age of 50 to get my master's. Um, and then before graduation, I created my own internship here at the reference department. Uh, at NPS, basically by a cold call, coming in and asking to speak with the library director as an informational interview, not seeking a job or anything, just wanted to find out about what it would be like to work here, what they do here. And then one thing to have led to another, I became a student temp worker, and then unexpectedly uh, an opening for a reference librarian appeared and I applied for it and then got the job. So altogether I've been here uh, eight years. Oh, I forgot to mention in the very beginning when I first came, I volunteered as an unpaid intern for about three months. Um, other tips I'd recommend getting any kind of internship. I know San Jose State has or had a, a formal internship program where you could pick and choose uh, different types of agencies where you would like to intern. I don't know if it's still occurring, but also keep in mind you can create your own. Um, that is a possibility. It's a great learning experience for both yourself and for the organization. If you're interested in a federal job, uh, I highly encourage you to learn how to write an effective resume in usajobs.gov. Um, it was impressed upon me to how you write your resume is very important because part of the process is computerized that matches terms within the job description to your resume. So if you can make that first cut, you have a better chance of making the final cut. Um, also, in our experience, it's, it takes a long time to get hired, six months, sometimes more, uh, with the system that we use, unfortunately. <clears throat> but you can get a jump on things with USA Jobs by creating a profile, and you can set alerts for job searches. I'm sure you know that already. Uh, another thing about this job here, the librarians are not faculty. So in a .edu, you are, um, I mean, in, in academia, you are considered faculty typically, but we are not. So we're not expected to do some faculty type activities such as publishing. But we are though encouraged to share information via conferences and other venues. Um, I've been told that some military schools are converting library positions to non-tenured faculty. And then, Finally, if you happen to be in the Monterey area this Friday, uh, the base is going to be open for an out outreach effort called Discover NPS Day. Um, the library will be open. You're welcome to stop by. We are giving drop-in tours. Just a heads up though, you will be sharing the campus with thousands of other school-aged children who are there to visit the labs and um, get excited about all that other stuff. <clears throat> For me, it has been working here at NPS has been a rewarding career choice, blending both military and academic library service into one. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, since we're running a little bit over, what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna go right into uh, Clara's presentation. Um, at, now, before we do that, I do wanna remind everybody, um, if you have questions, make sure you put them into the chat. And uh, we're gonna do everybody's questions at the end after we're done recording. Um, and for everybody listening to this recording, I do wanna, and for those of you who are here, I do wanna remind you of our next program. It's gonna be on November 27th. Um, at 6.15 social time and 6.30, uh, LIS Professional Associations Cast Your Network. We're going to have professionals from um, the national chapters of SLA, ALA, SAA, as well as ACES, who are going to tell you about how you can inv get involved um, with the national organizations. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now.